A couple years ago, pre-quarantine, obviously, one of my favorite things to do was go to my local Barnes & Noble, which had a cafe inside of it, order myself a coffee, and then get some magazines from the rack and just sit and read them for a while. In one of the magazines, there was a feature on two white women with a true crime podcast that had blown up recently called My Favorite Murder. I thought it was kind of a weird title, and I wasn't really into true crime, so I kind of glossed over the feature and then went on with my reading. Then, a little later, when I was looking up podcasts to listen to on my commute, because I had a really long commute to my job, I heard a YouTuber mention that their favorite podcast to listen to on commutes was My Favorite Murder. Again, I was like, it's not really my thing, but eventually I ran out of stuff to listen to. So, I downloaded a few episodes to listen to on my way to work. And I was immediately overwhelmed by the not-like-other-girls, quirky, white-girl energy of it all. Because they start off with why they love true crime and shit, and it's like, okay, didn't ask. I'm kidding. Um, kind of. But also, it was so strange how they treated it like a personality trait. Like, these weren't necessarily the girls pretending to be horses at recess in elementary school, but they were definitely the girls who sat around reading Harry Potter and establishing that they're probably the evil greenhouse. Listen, I never read Harry Potter, and I'm very proud of that. I never really got into the show because I was so put off by the first episode, but I'll discuss more of what I didn't like about it later on in the video. Because before I get into my problems with my favorite murder, I think I have to set up my problems with contemporary true crime culture as a whole. In my recent video on the psychological horror of gaslighting, um, don't worry, you can watch it after this one. It's not going anywhere. I talked briefly about Jack the Ripper, and I'd like to expand on that a little today. Jack the Ripper and the sensationalism surrounding him was probably one of the first instances of widely acknowledged public fascination with the gruesome details of a murder case. People being interested in the macabre is definitely not a recent trend. I mean, hello, people literally used to gather around the town square to watch public executions as a form of entertainment. So what is more recent is the commercialization and commodification of it. And I think this leads into a discussion of the way people consume true crime content now. Like, for example, I used to watch Forensic Files, but that focus was always on the forensics, the investigation, and how the case was inevitably solved. It interviewed families of victims, investigators, and then wrapped up the case within 20 to 25 minutes. Compare this with the recent Netflix docudrama, Crime Scene, Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. A limited series with four 54-minute episodes to focus on one case. The show is very atmospheric, with moody background music to set the tone, curated stock footage to suggest footage of Elisa Lam before her death as she blogs on Tumblr. The production value of the show is obviously huge, and it almost feels like they don't even know what to do with it all sometimes. You know, there's this Stephen King quote from his book On Writing where he says that for a finished work, you should cut out about 10% from your first draft. While I think that's a great rule of thumb for Stephen King and not necessarily good for everyone, I do think this series would have benefited from trimming some of the excess. As in, maybe cutting two of the episodes entirely and just making this a 90 to 120 minute documentary. I don't think it needed four episodes, especially because the first episode doesn't even really begin delving into the case at all. It sets up the mystery and intrigue behind the Cecil Hotel, and I'm sure some of you will be like, well, you're being nitpicky because I liked it, and I would tell you, well, maybe you should make a video talking about everything you liked about it, actually. Good luck! But I think it just serves to bloat and dramatize a tragic story for the sake of what? making it more entertaining, you could say. But it is weird that the focus of this young woman's death is to make it more entertaining. And I think this illustrates one of the biggest shifts in how people consume true crime content. In episode two, they talk about internet sleuths and this online community of people that are obsessed with personally investigating these crimes. And then in episode three, they touch on the genre of vlogger or blogger that cover these kinds of true crime stories. The series is basically an extended look into Elisa Lam's death. 
but it's more so about the Cecil Hotel and I guess the circumstances inspired by her initial disappearance, as well as the eventual discovery of her body in the water tank. Elisa Lamb and her death are treated less as a young woman and her tragic circumstances and more of a cultural phenomenon. It's a spectacle for people to marvel at, and that's reflected in the weird reproduced shots they include in the show. There's even a part where they have a model or a body double basically posing in a water tank as Lamb's dead body, and honestly, that just feels very unnecessary and voyeuristic to me. When the LAPD was initially looking for Lamb, they released the much-discussed elevator footage. Uh, I won't show it. If you really want to, you can find it easily online. But the point I want to make isn't really about the footage. It's what the proliferation of the footage did, which was to make the public invested in the story in a heightened way. And not only invested, but also feel as though they were a part of the investigation. People were fascinated by this elevator footage, honestly, by the novelty of it. The investigators in the series even mentioned that they were flooded with what was basically lots of white noise. People were sending in personal theories, speculation, sometimes outright unproven rumors, ultimately not contributing anything useful. What's weird to me about the situation is why they would have bothered releasing the elevator footage at all. Like, I understand putting out a picture of a missing person because you want the public to assist in looking for them and to let you know if they think they see her. But why the elevator footage? They knew who Elisa Lam was. Her family were the ones who reported her missing initially, so photos were easily accessible if necessary. It's almost like cops have a history of stupid and irresponsible decisions. The release of the footage and its subsequent virality is what caused this strange conspiratorial and sometimes irreverent quality to the Elise Lamb case, by the public at least. People talk a lot about parasocial relationships in terms of YouTubers and the people who watch them. A parasocial relationship is a one-sided relationship where one person invests emotional energy, interest, and time in another person or persona who often isn't even aware of their existence. It's pretty commonplace for us to sit down and watch YouTubers that are a lot like us, and for us to develop a sort of attachment to them. I'll be completely honest here, I love Emma Chamberlain, I think she's so funny and fun, but I've never met her, I've never spoken to her, I've never even commented on a video of hers. I think she's fun to watch and she seems like a person I'd probably want to be friends with in real life, but I can only base that conclusion on the parts of her online persona that she chooses to show. I don't actually know her and she doesn't even know that I exist. The reason I bring this up is because something I noticed with some of the so-called sleuths that were interviewed for the series was that they had also developed a sort of parasocial relationship with Lamb. They were reading her old Tumblr blog entries, combing through any relevant information they could find on her on the internet, and frankly, projecting a lot of unrelated personal feelings onto her. If someone were to ask me how many hours I've spent on this case, it will go into the territory of hundreds, maybe thousands of hours. For much of the time that I spent researching the case, I was in between jobs, so for me, it gave me a sense of purpose. I am a dental student, and I am a co-founder of the Elisa Lamb discussion group on Facebook. She was just like any 20-something on a pursuit to get to know herself. This sounds strange, but I began to feel connected to her. Elisa was someone who I'd never met. Why do I feel like I've just lost a friend, a sister, someone that I genuinely care about? I knew it was up to every one of us. If we just remain vigilant, can we get justice? Most cases, based only on an elevator video, a picture, and some blog posts. While I don't think all parasocial relationships are bad just by virtue of being parasocial, I do think that projecting all of this onto any person is unhealthy and leads to situations like this, where people get so emotionally invested in a case that they can't bring themselves to accept that the simplest explanation is the most probable situation. That Lamb had bipolar disorder and she had a history of not taking her medication, which led to episodes of extreme mood changes. A friend of mine has bipolar disorder, and when they were going through an episode before being clinically diagnosed, they exhibited a lot of similar behaviors to Elisa Lamb. 
Lamb was acting paranoid, possibly experiencing hallucinations, and in a delusional state of mind. And in a state like this, the person most at danger is the person themselves. They need help. Yet most people watching this didn't see a young woman that possibly needed help. They saw someone to ogle at and sensationalize. They saw someone to project supernatural theories and stories onto. And to an extent, I don't even necessarily fault a lot of these people for this response. I attribute the reaction to how demonized mental illness is in the media, like remember Split? This is the real life impact of movies that villainize and demonize mental illness. When people see a person having an episode, a person that needs help, they think, wow, she must be possessed. She must have been hunted. This isn't even limited to movies. A recent profile of former actress Shelley Duvall drew attention to a sensationalist and frankly exploitative interview that Dr. Phil did with her a few years back. She made some strange statements in the interview that were blown up and used by Phil McGraw, Dr. Phil, to present Duvall as a spectacle for his audience to ogle at. He presents it as a way for him to help her, but really it was just to get views. Because all this bald bitch cares about is internet clout and money. Literally, f**k wannabe Dr. Phil McGraw, okay? Also, Big Joel did a good video going more in depth on what a f head Mr. Phil is, which you should watch after this video because it's not going anywhere. So yeah, people are kind of socialized to view mentally ill people, neuroatypical people, as horror movie stock characters. When, again, the person most at risk during an episode like this is the person themselves. Getting more into the voyeuristic public reception to Lamb's death, I think the disproportionate reaction and investment in the case illustrates how much the way people consume true crime content has changed. Before, you of course had people's fascination with Jack the Ripper, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, and so on. There was even such a widely acknowledged fascination with grisly murder cases that there was a satirical essay published on the subject mocking the press and the public's fascination with serial killers and murder cases entitled on murder considered as one of the fine arts. First published in Blackwood's Magazine in 1827 by Thomas De Quincey, the essay was so popular it inspired a follow-up as well as a collection of essays on the subject. In an analysis of the initial publication, Frederick Berwick says, In this respect, the consideration of murder as a fine art is no satire at all. It recognizes and analyzes the workings of a morbid curiosity shared by humanity at large. How close can art bring the viewer or reader to the actual horror of violent crime? What strategies of distancing are necessary if murder is to be considered as a fine art? Berwick asserts that De Quincey achieves this strategy of distancing not through comic relief that interrupts the narrative, but rather a kind of gallows humor integrated into the account of the murder itself. De Quincey also manipulates the reader's attentions simply by elaborating the psychology of fear. Although he does not omit the gory details, he does not linger over them in his usual effulgent style, creating his shock effects, rather, with a sparse economy of prose, he then shifts attention from the brutality of the murder to the response of the potential victim. The boy feigning sleep in his bed while the murderer is slitting the throat of his companion. The servant girl returning to the darkened household in which the fiendish murderer still lurks. De Quincey wrote at a period before detective stories had emerged as literary genre catering to the very fascination which he had identified. If De Quincey in his essay on murder had given a name to the genre, he would have called it neither detective story nor criminal story. For him, it was a victim story. I wanted to include this analysis because this perspective, this focus on victims, is what I think was lost in the expansion of true crime culture. It's become more about the detectives, sure, and that's something else I want to talk about. But above all else, I think it's become more about the perpetrators. Even in the Elisa Lam case, people were so enraptured with it because they wanted to know who did it. Who could have done such a thing? and then gotten away with it so cleanly. Lamb became a victim not just of a tragedy, but of a mastermind serial killer 
or a government conspiracy or whatever else neatly slotted into people's theories. People were so enamored with this idea that they literally started making up theories about people who had just happened to stay in the Cecil Hotel and not even necessarily stayed in the Cecil Hotel at the same time as Elisa Lamb as evidenced by the horrible backlash that death metal singer Morbid received when a bunch of internet sleuths decided they had enough evidence to say that he was the killer. He gives an interview in the documentary about his experience with being on the receiving end of such violent vitriol and hate when he didn't actually do anything and there was no evidence to suggest that he even did. The harassment got to the point that he ended up attempting to take his own life. All because people on the internet wanted a neat and tidy resolution to this lamb case. And not even a neat and tidy resolution, actually. People on the internet wanted a fantastical killer to be at the end of this road. They didn't want to accept that maybe lamb was just a person who needed help, help that she did not receive. People wanted this to end like an episode of CSI, Law and Order, or whatever other propaganda shows are popular right now. To better illustrate this point, I'll bring up the popular true crime podcast, My Favorite Murder. Um, I'll just play you a clip to show you what I mean. Uh, my favorite murder, and it's going to be real fucked up, and Dustin brought up a great point that we might be inviting a murderer into our lives by doing this. I mean, but here's the thing, and this is why I'm so fascinated by this topic in yeah. general. We might already know a murderer. Oh my god, like, probably. Probably, and in that way where they're just in a very cat-like, removed, Dexter way, just observing yeah. all this with a kind of, oh, they think they're, they think they're smart. Yeah, isn't How that sweet. cute and quaint? Yeah, I mean, so I guess the disclaimer is please don't kill us because we can't do this podcast anymore if you I mean, the, the thought of like, for me, it's like you got away with it. For, like the thought of getting away with something like that is insane. And the fact that like the rest of your life, are you, you're either worrying constantly that you're going to get caught or you're a sociopath and you just don't worry about that shit. Yeah. Which, wouldn't that be great? Oh my god, it would be so great. Wouldn't and it be great that the only thing you have to worry about is getting caught for murder? For m murdering many people that part their hair down the middle. Or whatever your preference is. Ted Bundy. <laughs> Am I right, girl? Did I just spoil your favorite murder? <laughs> Don't tell me. No, no, no. So, like, no, what you did was pick up on the uh, reference I was dropping <laughs> oh, I like this. an expert. Oh, I fucking got this. This is why we're friends, is because we love murder. <laughs> you see what I mean? It stinks of, I'm not like other girls because I like the dark and depraved. And also serves as a great illustration of my point about what true crime is focused on now. The perpetrators. Of course, it's always specific types of perpetrators. You know, white guys. I know the podcast is supposed to be lighthearted and jokes, but it's such a weird thing to be glib about. Bringing it back to De Quincey's satirical essay on murder considered as one of the fine arts, he employed dark humor that did not interrupt the narrative with insensitive commentary or jokes. It was dark humor that ultimately centered the victims because, say it with me now, satire is meant to punch up, not beat a dead corpse. It's this weird fixation on perpetrators and serial killers that have led to trumped up narratives of these white killers. Let's use Ted Bundy as an example, all right? The narrative around him is always that he was this charismatic guy, this absolute mastermind that was able to manipulate those around him. But let's take a closer look at this. First of all, the guy looked like this, so like that should already tell you that there's some unreliable narrator shit going on. Secondly, and the main thing, the bitch was not a charismatic mastermind. According to the accounts provided by his mother and his own first-hand accounts, he had no social life. He was socially inept, didn't know how to make friends, and people did not go out of their way to interact with him. Even most of his smarts didn't translate to college, as is the case with most average white male students that are exalted for basically nothing in high school. Once he got to more rigorous university-level courses that challenged him to think critically, Bundy started doing very poorly in school. 
He dropped out of a major in Chinese, flunked out of a major in urban planning, and eventually dropped out of school altogether. I do want to clarify that I still think the American education system is shit and lots of people fail, drop out, or quit for a multitude of valid reasons. And I would even say that in most cases, higher education is not a great or even a good barometer for intelligence or success. But I will also say that because most of these true crime enthusiasts love to use arbitrary methods of measurement to claim that Ted Bundy was super smart, like his IQ, for example, which is cited often as proof of his supposed genius, I'm just similarly using these arbitrary methods of measurement to demonstrate that this man was not a mastermind or even like above average. I won't claim that my research was exhaustive, but I will say Of the numerous resources I looked into, including the ones I will flash on screen, everything about Ted Bundy being handsome and charismatic was speculation, exaggeration, or outright fabrication from the authors. They never had concrete evidence to say this was the case. What they would often do is take a piece of factual information and embellish it. Take, for example, this passage from the book, The Only Living Witness, The True Story of Serial Sex Killer Ted Bundy by Michaud G. Stephen and Hugh Ainsworth. They write of his kleptomania. Ted was not a thief in any ordinary sense. He didn't take any money and he wouldn't take merchandise for the purpose of selling it. The need was much closer to kleptomania, and it was overpowering. Yet he was never once caught for shoplifting anything. A remarkable fact in light of the number of thefts he made and the way he went about them. Even professional shoplifters, people schooled in the most refined techniques of their trade, customarily have long arrest records. Now, ignoring how ridiculous it is that these authors are surprised that a white man wasn't jailed for something that we would ordinarily expect to result in jail time, it's very telling that they never cite any particular statistics to back up their claim that professional shoplifters, which like, what even is that, have long arrest records. Just to demonstrate how stupid this claim is, let's talk about the bling ring. You've probably heard of them, a bunch of literal 17-year-olds that went around robbing some of the highest-profile celebrities in contemporary Hollywood, with their theft ultimately totaling to an estimated $3 million. And they were basically only caught because they were bragging about it to people and openly posing with the stolen, easily recognizable designer items online. There's a good video on them that goes more in-depth that I'll link in the description if you want more info, which, again, you can watch after this video because otherwise it'll mess up my analytics. Another claim, that he was handsome. Again, there is nothing to verify this. I have my eyes, which clearly tell me another story. But let's dissect this. The Lake Sammamish Incident. Ted Bundy had his arm in a fake sling and approached a young woman named Mary Osmer for help loading his car, obviously because of the sling. She agreed because, again, he appeared to be injured. And then when she realized that she would have to go to a secondary location with him, she refused to continue any further and returned to the beach. All right, so what was the mastermind strategy here? Faking the injury? That's not being a genius. That's something I used to do in fourth grade to get out of PE because I didn't want to play kickball that day. He was banking on people being polite enough to help him out. Was he attractive then? No. If he had been confident that his looks would have been enough to lure young women to follow him back to his car, he wouldn't have needed the fake arm sling. He wasn't seducing women. He was feigning injury to get pity. Even then, Osmer was suspicious enough that she refused to go to a secondary location with him. Yet despite this, the story is embellished substantially by Robert Keppel and William Burns in The River Man. They dramatize the event, writing, He was described by people who saw him later that afternoon as a good-looking, all-American type wearing blue jeans and a white shirt. First of all, why do they sound so horny for this man, and what does all-American even mean? 
and they never actually bring up who said this. They'll bring up quotes, actual quotes from some of the people who Ted initially tried to victimize, but they never bring up who described him as handsome or good looking. The young stranger asked Mary, who was clad in a very short, backless halter type dress, if she would help him load his sailboat into his car. Interesting that they specified she was in a very short, backless halter dress. Was it relevant? I don't think so, but you know, let's just keep going. She agreed with a perky, sure. Perky? How could they possibly know that? He asked her what she was doing and she replied that she was waiting for her husband and parents. He quickly changed the conversation. So they're making conversation and she immediately brings up her parents and husband. Does that sound like a woman that's flirting to you? Or does it sound like the kind of stuff you say when the weirdo on pump six tries to talk to you at the gas station? When Mary Osmer later told us her story, her eyes glistened with guilt. To her, the stranger seemed friendly, sincere, very polite and easy to talk to. He had a nice smile and didn't get upset when she told him she wouldn't go with him. She was pretty, 22 years old, newly married, and almost overwhelmed by the dangerous excitement of the mere thought of infidelity that she had had when she was approached by this attractive stranger. She wasn't your average vague eyewitness, but gave us a detailed physical description of him when questioned. They don't provide any actual quotes in this entire passage. They bring in a lot of flowery language, talking about her glistening eyes and how pretty she was. They ascribe feelings of being overwhelmed by dangerous excitement at the mere thought of infidelity with this attractive stranger, their words. But if infidelity was on her mind, why bring up her husband at all? Why refuse to go with him when he tried to get her to a secondary location? Maybe because she wasn't actually thinking all of this and they're just projecting a bunch of weird thoughts onto this random young woman. It reads less like a crime study and more like a trashy detective novel. Is that mean? I don't care. It's so weird to be jacking it to some murderer like this. And again, he did not lure these women with charisma. In fact, in the case of Lake Sammamish, he was unsuccessful multiple times over, even with the fake injury. Multiple accounts from the day even asserted that he wasn't all that charming or suave. In the same book, Keppel and Burns write that Bundy's potential victims said that he seemed too intent on what he was after and was uncomfortably nervous. Furthermore, they said he had spoken rapidly as if he were reading a script and he acted as if he had a hidden agenda. His eventual victim, Janice Ott, though we can't know what she was thinking or her thoughts as she went with Ted Bundy, he was still using the slang and still asking for help. The most I can assume is that she saw a man that needed help because he was injured and she was polite enough to try and help. This man was not the fictionalized portrayals of serial killers you see on TV. He wasn't smart, he was not handsome, and he was a Republican, so you know he didn't have an ounce of charm on him. Literally, like, remember the Ted Cruz Zodiac Killer meme? Every time someone talks about Ted Bundy, I want you to imagine Ted Cruz doing that shit. Is it still charming and genius? Or is it just kind of sleazy and gross? Pathetic, actually, because this guy was so fucking inept at just talking to women that he resorted to faking injuries and acting like a victim so that he could take advantage of them. Ted Bundy was a f***ing incel. Over and over, the authors refer to Bundy as good looking and handsome, so much so that I don't even blame the reader if they end up misconstruing their embellishments as fact. Because readers often have the expectation when they're reading something like a book touting itself as a true crime biography that the writers have done their due diligence and wouldn't intentionally lead them astray. I mean, like, same with video essays, right? You're expecting that I've done my research and you trust me when I tell you that this is what my research has found. But honestly, I would encourage you to be more critical with the media you consume. Yes, including books and TV shows, but even video essays especially video essays, honestly, because anyone can upload a YouTube video and they require no peer review, no oversight. 
I could literally say anything right now and claim that I found it in my research. I mean, like something that does serve to reinforce my points is that I make direct references to evidence that support my claims. And I always leave links to where you can expand on the research in the description, though I'm sure that like 90% of you don't click in there to see. I'm not saying you shouldn't trust anyone, even though I kind of am. I'm just saying you should always be questioning what people tell you, even if they present it as fact. Even what I present in my videos, like I'm not an authority on anything. I'm just actually super smart and charming, unlike some people. The reason I went so in depth on Ted Bundy isn't just because I hate him and the culture surrounding him and other white man serial killers, even though I do, I do hate that. It's because I think it represents a lot of what I hate about contemporary true crime. Whenever I bring up my dislike of the genre, I also get two main reasons that people claim to like it. One reason is that they like to see the twisted things that people are capable of. Um, I won't really touch on that, though I will say that to me that's the equivalent of white dads that have a weird fixation on World War II history. Like, I like dark stories too, and I could recommend some to you if you like. Mine are fictional though. The other reason is that they fear that something like this could happen to them, so they want to read to inform themselves. While I acknowledge that something like this could feasibly happen to anybody, I also want to take a second to talk about this more in depth. When debunking all the reasons Ted Bundy was not as smart as you think he was, I didn't yet mention one of the biggest factors that contributed to this myth. If he wasn't a criminal mastermind, how did he go so long without getting caught? Are you ready for this one? He was a white man. No, I'm kidding. I mean, that definitely played a factor. For example, um, at the Lake Sammamish incident, he introduced himself with his real name every time. Witnesses from the day of the incident actually called into the police to report him by name when details of the murder were released. Hell, later into his crime spree, his girlfriend of the time got suspicious enough that she called into the police about him multiple times. And do you know what the police did? They looked at Ted Bundy, saw that he was a white man without a record, and said, but he could never, and didn't give him a second thought. There was also the fact that forensic evidence just wasn't as advanced back then, like DNA analysis, which is honestly instrumental in tracing crime, and coincidentally, leads me into my next point. When people say that they like true crime because these things could easily happen to them and they just want to educate themselves, it's just not true. Serial killers, defined as anyone who has killed two or more people, have been on the decline since the 1980s, decreasing by a shocking 85%. This is attributed to a combination of reasons, primarily being, as mentioned earlier, advances in forensic science, as well as the development of a more risk-averse culture, as in nobody hitchhikes anymore, nobody lets their kids run around by themselves at the park anymore. What about demographics? Of the people being killed that have been recorded in the serial killer database, so take this with a grain of salt, men and women are split pretty equally down the middle, with a slight lean toward women when accounting for the population, and two-thirds of serial killer victims are white, but black people are overwhelmingly overrepresented, accounting for 13% of the American population, but a staggering 24% of all victims. Recall that this racial disparity was also present in the population of people who have been incarcerated. Black Americans are overrepresented in the prison population precisely for the same reasons that killers like Ted Bundy are able to escape imprisonment for so long. The system was never meant to incarcerate people like them. This is also my biggest issue with true crime. That it, by the very nature of the genre, places an elevated importance on law enforcement. Most, if not all, true crime documentaries conclude with the cops finally showing up, arresting the perps, and locking them up for life. The end. Happy ending for everybody. But we know that's not really how it works. 
African American prisoners who were convicted of murder are about 50% more likely to be innocent than other convicted murderers and spend longer in prison before exoneration. If you're interested in supporting a project that works to exonerate those who were wrongly convicted, I'll include a link in the description where you can donate to the Innocence Project uh, as well as read up on their goals. So why has true crime continued to remain relevant? Well, I was going to start off this video by talking about how Jack the Ripper and the sensationalism around the case was kind of like the starting point for contemporary true crime as we know it. But in doing some of my research, I found a paper written by Rebecca Frost titled Identity and Ritual, the American Consumption of True Crime, in which she was similarly doing some research and stumbled across an interesting phenomenon that had occurred in America, actually, a century prior to the Jack the Ripper killings. Remember when I was talking about how people used to gather at public executions as a form of entertainment? Well, according to a paper by Ronald A. Bosco titled Lectures at the Pillory, the Early American Execution Sermon, there was actually such a thing as Puritan preachers giving sermons at these public executions. He says, Puritan theory held that a sermon was a means of conversion, or, to use Cotton Mather's term, a net of salvation. The execution sermon was developed in form and style during the earliest days of New England settlement in order to both expand on the individual's opportunities to recognize the presence of grace and to direct him away from compromising behavior. Although it is historically true that the practice of addressing condemned men at the gallows was current in England at the beginning of the 17th century, the New England Puritans' practice of preaching to condemned men both in church and at the gallows, and their use of a sermon form rather than simple moral discourse as was common in England, appear to be unique to in 17th century English-speaking communities. Usually the focus of the sermons was to set aright the negative effects of the loss of purpose evidenced by secularization in the community. So, dating back to the 17th century, we can look to these execution sermons as an early method of Americans moralizing through true crime. Frost, in her paper, draws a connection between these execution sermons and contemporary true crime books saying that they fulfill the same function as past printed crime narratives, including the execution sermon, the trial report, and newspaper articles, despite the differences between each printed form. Although some of the causes have changed over the years, especially with the transition between murder has remained a consistent threat to feelings of communal safety and requires attention from an authoritative community member, a minister, a judge, a reporter, an author, to present the criminal act and resulting consequences in such a way that reassures the community and directs communal emotions about crime, criminal, and victims. I guess you could say it's always been an iteration of the just world hypothesis, a logical fallacy that suggests that if you're a morally good person who does good things, good things will happen to you. The inverse being that if bad things happen to you, you must have brought it upon yourself somehow by being a morally bad person who does bad things. I'm simplifying it a lot, but that's the gist of it. We live in a crazy world that doesn't make a lot of sense and bad things happen to good people all the time. It's understandable that we create ways to make sense of it all and find some meaning to it. It explains why some people were so enraptured by the Elisa Lam case and why the authors describing Bundy's victims took so much effort to describe the victim's looks and what they were wearing. Historically, true crime has served as a way to moralize the world and almost give meaning to suffering, because we don't want to admit that there's no reason that that couldn't have been us. We don't want to admit that bad things happen to good people all the time. This video took so long to put together. Literally, I wanted to get this out like two or three weeks ago, so I'm glad it's finally over. As you can tell, it took a lot of research and time, so if you have any sympathy, please consider pledging to my Patreon. 
Patrons get exclusive monthly bonus content. I currently have a 20 minute video up on Netflix's new movie, I Care A Lot, so you can check that out. Uh, as well as early access to videos and sneak peeks of new exciting stuff. Of course, you can still support me by simply liking and commenting for engagement and continuing to watch my videos. I love that too. Thanks for watching.